Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. <clears throat> this is the Rebuild America, how a modern transportation infrastructure can create jobs and help the environment. America must modernize and improve our infrastructure in the area of transportation to be competitive in the 21st century global economy. Improving our nation's infrastructure will create good jobs for U.S. workers, reduce congestion, and provide more transit, walking, and biking options for all of us. In framing the discussion about transportation infrastructure, we must consider how to improve energy efficiency, reduce dependence on oil, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. This may include the use of clean or, or alternative fuels with an emphasis on how to maintain, protect, or enhance the environment and avoid adverse environmental impact. At the same time, we have to promote job creation. According to an economic analysis of infrastructure investment prepared in October 2010 by the Department of Treasury, I quote, research has shown that well-designed infrastructure investments can raise economic growth, productivity, and land values, while also providing significant positive spillovers to areas such as economic development, energy efficiency, public health, and manufacturing. The report continues to say that investing in transportation infrastructure creates middle-class jobs. 61% go to the construction sector, 12% would be in manufacturing, 7% would be in retail trade, and a total of 80% in these three sectors. Nearly 90% of those jobs most affected by infrastructure spending would be middle class jobs. Here's some transportation facts I, I'd like you to consider. The average American family spends more than $8,600 a year on transportation. That's one third more than they spend on food. For the 90% of the Americans who are not among the top 10% in income, transportation costs absorb one out of every six dollars of income. This is due in large part to how expensive it is to own a car. Multimodal transportation investments are critical to get American families moving again without wasting their time and money sitting in traffic. This panel today brings together experts to discuss the need and the ways we can rebuild America and leave a lasting economic and environmental foundation for future generations to build upon. I'm honored to be the moderator today, and I'd like to introduce uh, the panel to you. Ann Canby, Canby is director of the One Rail, One Rail Coalition. She is formerly Secretary of Transportation from 1993 to 2001 in Delaware. Uh, she is recognized nationally as a progressive leader in the transportation field for transforming a traditional highway agency into a multimodal mobility provider and as an advocate for integrating land use and transportation planning. Anne previously led a consulting practice focusing on institutional and management issues with particular emphasis on implementation of legislation in ICE-T. She also has served as commissioner of the New Jersey Transportation, excuse me, New Jersey Department of Transportation, treasurer of the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority, and deputy assistant secretary of the U.S. Department of Transportation. Thank you for joining us today, Anne. Cecil D. Corbin Mark is deputy director and Director of Policy Initiatives, We Act for Environmental Justice. A lifelong resident of Hamilton Heights in Harlem, New York, where his family has lived for the last nine decades. He launched the New York State Transportation Equity Alliance, NYSTEA. He served in the Metropolitan Transportation Authority's Blue Ribbon Sustainability Commission. He holds a BA in Political Science from Hunter College and a Master's of Philosophy in International Relations from Oxford University in the UK. Thank you for joining us. Patrick Eiding is president of the Philadelphia Council AFL-CIO. Serving his fourth term as president of the Philadelphia Council, he represents over 100 local unions in the Philadelphia area. Mr. Eiding served for over 25 years as business manager and financial secretary of the Insulators 
and asbestos workers local 14 covering Philadelphia and southern New Jersey where he has been a member since 1963. He serves as secretary treasurer of the Philadelphia Building Trades Council. He's a member of the executive council of the Pennsylvania AFL-CIO and on the general board of the National AFL representing central labor councils in the Northeast. He represents the interests of working families by serving as an active member of numerous boards and commissions, including the Philadelphia Area Labor Management Committee, the United Way of Southeastern Pennsylvania, and many other uh, organizations. He also sits on the Philadelphia City Planning Commission and was recently appointed to the newly created Philadelphia Works Incorporated. Thank you for joining us, Pat. John McCluskey is the general chairman of the Sheet Metal Workers International Association. He represents mem members on commuter rails, including SEPTA, New Jersey Transit, Long Island Rail, Metro North Rail, MBCR in Boston, and Amtrak. He worked at the Amtrak Heavy Overhaul Shop in Delaware for 13 years. He emigrated to the U.S. from Ireland in 1994 and is married with two children. He joined his first union back in 1987 has been a proud union member ever since. He had the honor of speaking on Capitol Hill at a Blue Green Alliance event back in 2010. Thanks for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure being here today. I myself uh, am the director of Keystone Development Partnership. I serve as a statewide coordinator for the Keystone Transit Career Ladder Partnership that has 32 public transit agencies in Pennsylvania and 33 unions that have participated in a training consortium since 2001. The Pennsylvania Department of Labor and Industry funded our organization to replicate that partnership for the utilities industry serving gas, water, and electric utility companies and unions. I'd like to uh, start the discussion off by asking uh, Mr. Eiding a question. Uh, the Philadelphia Council has a long history of mobilizing union members for public transit funding. Can you talk about your role in that struggle and how transportation and the infrastructure affects jobs in the Philadelphia area? Sure, Stu. Uh, first of all, I think we recognize uh, very clearly that transportation is not a special interest subject. Uh, it's, a, it's a subject that ha has an effect on all folks, whether they're folks working in hotels, whether they're folks that are working as engineers, it has an effect on everybody. One of the things we recognized here in Pennsylvania is that we have public transportation, but we've never funded public transportation. Uh, years ago, the, uh, the people who had the transportation here in Philadelphia was the PTC, the Philadelphia Transportation Corporation. It was a privately owned corporation. We made it a public entity. We've made transportation public across the state. But the state has never, no matter what administration, sat down and put in permanent funding. Not permanent funding that would establish some way of, of, of increasing transportation as, as we know and need it in Pennsylvania, <clears throat> and particularly in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and areas like that. But what folks should realize, that transportation is a, is a, uh, a needed co economy that uh, goes across the whole state, whether it be out in the counties or in the cities. So uh, or a little over five years ago, uh, recognizing the fact that we were never going to progress in transportation, public transportation, and even on highways, if we didn't put some effort together as a coalition. So our labor folks here in Philadelphia started to get together, and we come up with the idea of, of creating a coalition for public transportation. And conveniently, we, we named it PTC, which had a connotation from years past. Uh, and some of us who are remnants of Philadelphia, as the mayor described, uh, realized what it was then and what it is now. The coalition, as it came together, was 60 different groups of people, whether it was neighborhood groups, religious groups. Labor had a tremendous uh, impact on funding and getting it off the ground. But the folks who represented hotels, folks who represented hospitals, and I'm not talking about the labor unions, I'm talking about the corporations, I'm talking about the owners, they all came together, and, and I would say about five, six years ago. And we put together the PTC to try to get the legislators in Pennsylvania to realize that the time has come to put together some permanent funding. Because the way that the transportation is funded now, th there's a tremendous effort just to maintain, and not really uh, able to do a good job of that, but we're never ever in progress. You know, what we know in and around Philadelphia, there's a tremendous infrastructure that put into use could be the kind of transportation 
that the 21st century deserves. And so we put this coalition together and we had some impact. It carried itself across the whole state. We hired a train to go to, to Harrisburg on a particular day. Folks came from all over to go to Harrisburg. We set, took a message to Harrisburg and it had some impact. Unfortunately, what happens in, in, uh, in, in governments and, and uh, political uh, venues, if you will, things get left go and we don't continue the effort that we should. So we're poised today to continue that effort. Uh, we work together with the Chamber of Commerce. We work together with the uh, uh, SEPTA folks and everybody else. We're waiting and trying now to put another effort together to follow up what we did five years ago to try once again to get the public transportation into the, uh, into the public the way it should be because it's needed in both the folks who build it but also the folks who have to get to work every day. Folks who don't have the means to buy a car and quite honestly we should be looking for ways that folks don't have to buy a car. So it has a tremendous impact on labor not only in the infrastructure building but what an effect it has on folks being able to go to work every day. Thank you. As a member of the Transport Workers Union Local 234, I'm uh, personally very interested in transit funding for my work, as well as what it means for the community. In Pittsburgh, the Port Authority of Allegheny County is faced with a $64 million deficit for the upcoming fiscal year. They released a slew of prepares fare hikes, proposed fare hikes and service cuts in January of this year. That includes 46 route eliminations out of 102. Service reductions and service reductions for the rest. They said it would have to eliminate another 500 and 600 to 600 jobs from the payroll. Cecil, I'd like to ask you: How does a, a cutback like that impact a community, and what would you propose as a response? <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> um, I think the impacts are pretty severe on communities when you talk about uh, drastic cuts like that. Um, you know, we just heard about how transportation touches everybody's lives, and uh, particularly public transit, for those who are uh, transit dependent, uh, that is, is absolutely true. And so the ability to get to work on a regular basis, uh, the ability to get to the hospital if you need it, the ability to get kids to school, all of these are things that uh, transit dependent people rely on the public transit system to be able to do. Um, if they're late for work, then they can't keep a roof over their heads. If their kids are missing school, they're not getting an education. Um, if someone needs to get to the hospital in uh, communities that are transit dependent, uh, they're going to either be really sick or possibly die. So those are some of the uh, impacts. Uh, in terms of what should be done, it's always astonishing to me that people get called experts for doing something, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. But when it comes to sort of transit decisions, those who make the decisions are often not the people who use the system. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not knocking that there are other kinds of expertise that can be brought to help run a system effectively. But for people who use the system every day and for people who work the system every day that make those buses and trains run, not to be at the decision-making tables, I think leads to these kinds of decisions. So what would I do? I would legislate that the workers who work in the system and the riders who use that system every day have seats on the governing boards of authorities that make these decisions. <laughs> Simply American to me. You know, um, but it doesn't happen. And again, I'm not knocking the types of expertise that a real estate mogul can bring to, you know, the, the Allegheny Port Authority. That's important expertise. You know, transit systems have to buy land and property too. But uh, that's the first thing I would do. Now, I'm also not an advocate for just anybody sort of jumping up and being in charge of how the taxpayer's money is spent. So I'm not talking about picking up, you know, Joe Schmo from the corner or Gail Goodlady from the house next door and saying, here, you sit on the board. That's not what I'm talking about. I am talking about, however, citizens who actually go through some training on how to run uh, boards, how to manage public tax dollars, 
and that they are in some ways ready to assume that responsibility. So that they are taking on this responsibility with the knowledge of how the system or those boards really work so that the wool isn't pulled over their eyes once they're in those seats of authority. But even more important than that, both the worker voting representative and the rider voting representative, in my mind, need to be accountable to both the workers and the riders. And I don't mean by just you know, saying that they are the public's representative. I mean that they need to come back out into the community and report on what's going on, report about how they voted in particular situations. That's one thing. The other thing with the Pittsburgh scenario is that it's my understanding that this is, you know, these cuts and fare increases have been going on for quite a long time. Uh, from September 02 through January 11, essentially the total fare increases for what are called Zone 1 trips in Pittsburgh are, uh, are roughly in the neighborhood of 65 cents. And for Zone 2, trips, that's uh, about a dollar and 25 cents the increases have amounted to in total fare increases. I also understand that they've been uh, proposing for quite some time to toll Interstate 80 to raise funds. And I'm, I am one of those people that says that, you know, all transportation systems need uh, revenue. And so tolling I-80 may not necessarily be everybody's favorite idea, but roads are not free. People pay to get on the public transportation system, and roads require that they uh, be paid for as well, especially the interstate system. And so that failed in the legislature, and I think that's a lack of leadership. Last thing I'll say is that um, the governor uh, of this state, this great commonwealth, um, uh, has passed the buck in my estimation. Now, I'm not a resident of Pennsylvania. I come to visit Philadelphia. I have family from Pittsburgh. But I think it is ridiculous for a governor in a budget announcement to say something like, and I quote, you know, this is not a budget item. It is too large for that. Transportation must be confronted as its own district and separate topic. This problem has grown for the past several decades, and it will not be solved overnight. But whatever solution we enact must be a lasting one. I've spent significant time considering this issue and developed some workable solutions. However, those solutions will only be possible with your input, assistance, and support. Where's the workable solution? How much time did you spend crafting that statement versus coming up with a fixed set of financing? If the, if the problem has been here for decades, I know you haven't been governor for decades, but for crying out loud, people aren't stupid. If you say something like that, it means that you are not coming up with solutions, that you are passing the buck. Transportation, public transportation in particular, is a very significant investment, not only in the rail cars and the buses, but it is a significant investment in restarting and powering our manufacturing sector. Those rail cars and buses could be built in my state, New York. <laughs> they could also be built right here in Pennsylvania, too. And I think that not making these solid investments that aren't rated every year to pay for something else is the way that many governors have gotten by on not addressing these problems, and I think it needs to be stopped. Thank you. I think we'll continue to frame the situation here and then maybe return back to uh, the history and example that Pat brought out about what we can do. In, in that, um, last week, Congress approved an extension of the Safety Lou Bill until June 30th, 2012. What does that mean for transportation and investment in the infrastructure? And I was wondering if you could share some light on this about what we can do about appropriations for transit, and particularly in rail. 
Sure, Stu. Thanks very much. And it's great to be here in Philadelphia. I took the train up this morning from Wilmington and got here right on time. <laughs> Which probably wouldn't have happened if I'd been on I-95. <laughs> I hate that section of road between my house and the airport. Uh, very unreliable. But back to Washington. Very unreliable. That's a pretty, pretty good word. <laughs> um, as you all know, the Senate last week passed a pretty bipartisan bill extending for two years, now it's a little less than two years, uh, the Highway and Transit Authorization. Um, and there it sits. The House had a bill out of committee and they can't seem to figure out how to get one to the floor that they can get enough votes out of their caucus to pass. So uh, we went into, I think it's the ninth extension, as Stu mentioned, for uh, another 90 days. Whether they can get it together or not remains to be seen. I'm not betting on it, but the closer we get to a date in November, the less likely it is that I think it'll happen uh, in any major uh, way, which is unfortunate because we desperately need that investment in transportation and the stability that a long-range and long-term program provides. From the rail perspective, I would say right now, uh, the Senate bill doesn't do a great deal. Uh, there is a rail title in there, which is good, and there are some requirements for rail planning that the feds have to do, and the state may do a rail plan if it wants to apply for funding. Um, there is no money for uh, passenger rail uh, in this bill. Uh, and so from our standpoint, from the rail uh, perspective, the appropriations uh, issue is the one that we need to focus on uh, this year and we'll see whether authorization makes uh, progress uh, over time. Uh, and the administration, and I've not heard a lot of people talking about this, quite often administration proposals for the budget don't get a lot of attention, but this one, I think, from a transportation perspective, merits a great deal of attention because they are striking out or proposing to strike out in some new directions to take what's called the Highway Trust Fund and turn it into a transportation fund that would have a highway account, a transit account, and they call it a multimodal account, which would be primarily for rail. And um, this is something that we desperately need. Getting back to uh, Cecil's point about how do we pay uh, for this, I happen to believe, having run a couple of state DOTs with more flexibility than many, that the gas tax is really a limiting factor in terms of being able to invest in other modes of transportation besides roads. And we need to find revenue sources that will enable us to make the best investment, not be driven by where the money comes from, which is too much what happens today. A gas tax is tied to the road system, as it should be, but it limits how much we can spend in other areas. Amtrak has been on starvation path for generations. And just recently, uh, there's been more funding for Amtrak, and we're seeing great investments happening uh, in that railroad, and we're lucky to have it here on the East Coast. So the appropriations is a critical piece. Now, the ha House last week passed a budget for 2013 that actually breaks the agreement that was put together by everybody painfully. We all had to watch this last summer. And um, now we're going to go through the 2013 appropriations process, which is where we'll see uh, whether there is going to be real funding for transportation. Because in the absence of uh, authorizing legislation, the, the, um, the appropriations committee is what really uh, where it matters. So that's the critical point uh, for us uh, in the transportation world. For the last couple of years, as you know, there hasn't been money for the president's high-speed rail uh, program. We are in the process, and many states and Amtrak as well are in the process of spending the $10 billion that was put together under the stimulus program and in fiscal 2010. Um, and that's going to create jobs for sure. So we'll see how it plays out. But if we're going to get more rail, we need to step up the discussions about it. And our coalition has uh, started putting out some materials. And there's a sheet here that's available, I think, at the registration desk. It's about jobs in the rail industry. And it's the first time, I think, that we've ever been able to pull together passenger and freight in the same um, piece. 
that talks about rail jobs. There are almost uh, 300,000 jobs in the operating side of the rail world, which is the Class I railroads, the Amtrak short lines, and the commuter rail, which is SEPTA here in this region, as well as um, light rail and uh, heavy rail, the subway here and the light rail system here as well would be counted in that. But what's also important is the jobs in the rail supply industry, which is, and these jobs are good union jobs all across the uh, spectrum. There are more rail supply facilities in this country than there are Target and Macy stores combined. And we're in the process of putting this on a map to start showing people who are in the position to make decisions about how we could, if we were willing to invest more in the rail sector, and this is, we're way past the robber baron stage that uh, David referred to earlier. Um, the railroads, I think, are, are getting the picture of the opportunities for them to increase their business on the freight side, and the, there is huge public support for passenger rail in this country. Amtrak has had record ridership uh, throughout its system here in the corridor, but also in other long distance and state supported trains as well. So getting the word out about the good jobs that can be created if we would step up to invest in rail. And the private sector on the railroads are going to invest, they estimate about $13 billion in their system this year. And uh, take that in conjunction with what we anticipate uh, in the other rail sectors, about 28, almost $30 billion going into rail. Uh, and that will help create jobs and retain jobs that are in place today. So we think investment in rail and the appropriations process is where we've got to really focus to get money to ensure we continue uh, this progress. Thank you, Ann. Um, there was a lot of investment in uh, transportation infrastructure from the Stimulus Act. And a lot of ARA funds were issued to various states. Uh, I'd like to welcome John. I, I myself welded for uh, 20 years as a certified st structural welder. As a sheet metal worker, uh, your experience uh, right there in the shop. Can you tell me what, it, what was the impact from states like Florida, Wisconsin, and Ohio that turned back that transportation money that was meant for rail investment? Sure. Um, first of all, good morning. It's my pleasure to be among so many union uh, brothers and sisters and people that care about the environment like I do, uh, unlike the, the three governors of the states you just mentioned, Florida, <laughs> Wisconsin, and Ohio, three new governors, three Tea Party darlings. Uh, let's look at Florida, first of all. Um, the Florida legisl legislation approved back in 2009, Sunrail. In February 2011, one month into his term, Governor Scott rejected it. Despite having almost 10% unemployment in Florida, Governor Scott promised if he's elected a second term in seven years, he will create 700,000 new jobs. But he still rejected the federal funds for a free railroad. Why? Tea Party politics. There's no doubt whatsoever. It's Tea Party politics. Sunrail was to provide a high-speed rail line between Tampa and Florida. The government were going to put in $2.4 billion, government money, not Florida money. And he, Governor Scott rejected it. He said that he couldn't have this state obligated to possibly, his words, possibly having to pay operating costs in the future. Now, the Florida Department of Transportation itself said that it, it would be the Sunrail would have an operating surplus in its first year, 2015. Now, he rejected us one month into his term. Obviously, he didn't speak to his own people in the Florida Department of Transportation. By doing so, he rejected 24,000 jobs. Again, that's pure Tea Party politics. Now, these are equality American jobs, tax-paying jobs, union jobs. That struck it down, first of all, of course, they're union jobs, right? They would have stimulated the economy, the Florida economy, immediately. Again, almost 10% unemployment in Florida. Local <coughs> vendors, material supply vendors would have been affected immediately and through the near future and actually into the far future. Again, these are American jobs and green jobs and 
like I've said twice already, he rejected us one month into his term. Why, well, again, it's, it's tea, party, politics. He doesn't care about workers. He cares about looking good for the tea party. And, and it's, it's as simple as that. He'd rather us, he'd rather, should I say, you know, he's words, you hear it so many times on TV, drill, baby, drill. He wants to drill. Offshore drilling. Bring it to Florida, bring it to Florida. Well, the oil goes to China, the oil goes to India, and the profits go to offshore accounts like we've seen. It's the same type that Mitt Romney has you know, there. But, uh, and, and they're facts. These are facts. As for uh, Ohio and, and Wisconsin, just as bad. Both governors need this any more Wisconsin. He turned back, Governor Walker turned back $810 million in federal funds. Again, federal funds, not Wisconsin funds. It wasn't costing Wisconsin a dollar. And like Florida, these are going to be high-paying union healthcare holding jobs. State Senator uh, Coggs called it economic suicide when he turned back this money, $810 million. He said this isn't fiscal responsibility like Governor Walker claimed it was. Not just were there 5,000 jobs not created or retained, Wisconsin then had to pay back $134 million that it already invested in the construction. And he talks about fiscal responsibility. Governor Walker said when he turned back that money that our government, the federal government, can't afford to spend, spend, spend and put our economy in debt. However, when he spoke to Secretary LaHood and informed him that he was turning back the money, he also said, well, can you keep it in Wisconsin and we can use it on bridges and roads? This is the same money that we can't afford to spend, spend, spend. Again, it's a fact. And just four months after rejecting it, he applied for $150 million fund in the second round of funding that the government gave. Obviously, Wisconsin didn't get a dollar from that, but so you what kind of a hypocrite we're dealing with in Wisconsin. Wisconsin workers were going to manufacture these trains, these locomotives, the rail cars, right in Wisconsin. We're going to manufacture them there, we're going to maintain them there, we're going to operate them there. Wisconsin jobs, Wisconsin workers. There's a company in Wisconsin right now called Talgo. They're a Spanish company, but they build cars right in Wisconsin. They were set to build, take this 810 million, take a portion of it and build these rail cars right in Wisconsin. Obviously now the money is gone, so they're not going to build them anymore. And Talgo have 125 employees, and they say there's indirectly 450 employees just in that general area that are going to be affected by, the, by Talgo with, withdrawing. They haven't announced it yet, but it doesn't look too good for Talgo. Talgo um, are expected to announce that they're going to withdraw from Wisconsin in the fall of 2011. So again, fiscal responsibility, I don't think so. Now, Mitt Romney said that President Obama was out of touch if he thinks that we can bring back manufacturing jobs to the US. And, you know, who's out of touch? You, they're going to, they were going to be built right in Wisconsin, but having said that, of course, Governor Walker just went around the state of Wisconsin for the last weekend and endorsed uh, Mitt Romney, so that's the type of people that unfortunately we're up against. Um, when you look at Ohio, another state that turned back the money, a new, new governor, the Shell Company, they recently, last uh, June I believe it was, informed the governor that the reason they wouldn't locate a key transitional facility critical to tapping into the state's reserves of, of, of uh, shell, uh, the, uh, shale gas. And the top of their list for not investing in Ohio was there was a lack of rail infrastructure. So, you know, when Florida, Wisconsin, and Ohio turned this money back, where did it go? Well, in May 2011, it was announced that 15 states and Amtrak would receive this money. 336 million in manufacturing locomotives. High top of, top, state of the art, top union workers working on them. Every state surrounding the states I just mentioned received it. They were, they're going to receive some of this money. And, and uh, obviously, the, the, the impact on Wisconsin, Ohio, and Florida workers is, is devastating to the economy.
On that note, uh, Hyundai, actually who manufactures rail cars in Korea, opened a plant in Philadelphia a couple, about a year or so ago. Unfortunately, my local organized it uh, in the past year. And they're starting to assemble rail cars here in Philadelphia as a modest step towards uh, man bringing manufacturing back. We have a limited amount of time left, under five minutes, I'm told. So I was trying to figure out what would be a way that we could all turn this problem that we we're all facing into an opportunity. Uh, there's a real need to mobilize around these issues you've raised and join the community, unions, and environmentalists alike. Can we do a quick uh, final statement from each of you about what that might look like? Well, if you'd like me to start off, you know, we in the labor movement have a, a phrase that's called, we are one. And what that means emphatically is that we feel we represent all working people in whatever effort we put forward. In this day and age, we may be the last bastion to stick up for working people because of Wisconsin and Ohio. And you can see when we come together what we can do. You mentioned Hyundai and the rail cars. You know, because of efforts that we had going back eight years ago, when Hyundai was in here, uh, competing with some other company, they promised to come to Philadelphia, build their cars here, and also put their American uh, headquarters here. When they came here, we had to institute and organize and drive together with tra transportation workers because they forgot what we did. But my point for bringing that up is, because we were on top of that initiative in the very early days, we were able to make sure that not only did they come here, but when they came here, they, they were good citizens, and they did what they were supposed to do, what they promised to do. I think if we come together, as that coalition did six years, five and a half years ago, we have to make sure that the governor can't sit back and not have a plan. He has to have a plan or we have to give him a plan. And I think we have to come together with all the entities we need and make sure that to this day and age, we don't allow government to drive us into the ground and put our jobs into China and other areas. You know, if we're going to go into green economy, we've got to do things like step up programs, where all people have an opportunity to go to work. And we also have to do things like bringing manufacturing here so all the stuff for solar is not manufactured in China and all we get to do is put it up. That's what we have to do together. Um, I think that you know, these are natural partnerships. Uh, my organization, We Act for Environmental Justice, has had uh, probably a, a decade or 15 year long partnership with the Transport Workers Union Local 100 in New York City. Uh, we work with the Amalgamated Transport Union uh, in upstate parts of New York around these issues of getting both riders and, uh, and labor folks on the transit authority governing boards. This is not rocket science. Our interests are shared. Um, when we talk about uh, sort of the health and safety of workers, um, we've, uh, in our partnership, tried to address issues of reducing the impact of diesel uh, buses on uh, the quality of the air, but it's also a work safety issue because when you repair a diesel bus inside of a bus depot, those fumes are getting uh, you know, caught up in the environment that the workers operate in as well. And many bus drivers, we're told, don't even really live to sort of enjoy their pensions for long periods of time. So when we work together at solving sort of the air quality issue by eliminating diesel buses, um, pushing for newer buses to come on to fleets, uh, we are also working for workers' interests as well as community environmental issues. Um, those partnerships to me make absolute sense. Um, it's not difficult at all, I think, uh, it's not like pulling an elephant through a garden hose. <laughs> yeah, sure. You know, uh, thinking about Stu's question, we still live in a democracy. And maybe the biggest issue, and I think Senator Coons and the mayor mentioned this, is bringing people together. You're doing it here with the, the labor and environment and other interests that have come around this coalition. How do we make that bigger? How do we make the voice stronger? How do we find those issues, as Senator Coons is doing, that can bring folks that don't normally talk to each other together in common ground? And maybe we start a little small because we have such a toxic environment we're in, but let's find what the common interest is. We're doing it with inside this rail coalition. I can tell you it's not the most natural relationship for passenger and freight people to love each other. But we're trying to build a culture 
of working together and understanding each other better. So my sense is bringing together the public interest and the private interest and finding the common ground. We know what the issues are. We just have to help a broader range of people understand and get on board and move together because it is not impossible to accomplish the things we're talking about. But we're in this situation where it's hard for us to talk to people we don't agree with right now. And we've got to find a way to break that down and figure out what the smaller bore steps are that can build some relationships. And um, we're trying to do that within the rail community, and I think we just start building it in as many places and as many ways as we can to restart a conversation that desperately needs to happen to get jobs back and get prosperity back in this country. So we need to keep, <clears throat> collectively, we need to keep the pressure on our politicians. We need to keep the pressure on to fund Amtrak. Amtrak's ridership is up 40% since 2000, and that, that's incredible. Yet it's starved and strangled year after year where we have to go begging, the AFL-CIO have to go begging to our senators, to our congressmen for funds, and it's wrong. It's wrong. We need to keep the pressure on, uh, on New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, open back up the tunnel, start the construction of the tunnel again get those 44,000 jobs for, for our New Jersey um, citizens, take 67,000 tons of car exhaust out of, the, out of the air in one year. Again, just keep the pressure up. Together we can win. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you all. Uh, I'm a firm believer that if you get good people in a room talking about doing good things, good things can happen. And I'm hoping that this conference and the panel discussion today had uh, framed the discussion so that we can all move ahead together and make some changes. Thank you.